Well, thank you for having me. Uh, right, so uh, I will uh, try to basically tell you about how to prove what I think are, are the main theorems about this ADA periodic motivic state homotopy theory. And uh, well, I think it's, uh, it does take some effort to prove these things. So as, as much as I want to, I'm not going to be able to give like all details everywhere, but I will try to, well, I will try to tell you as much as I, I think I reasonably can. And of course, yes, the first thing I should say is that all of this is uh, based on joint work with Mike Hopkins. Um, and from now on, I'm probably going to be pretty bad with citing who proved what. And um, I'm sorry for that. And yeah, so let me try to begin with some sort of introduction, which is maybe even less formal than what's going to follow. And so what's, what's, the, what's the point? Well, the point is uh, that we have the following goal. Right, so we want to study the following category. Study this category S Ada periodize. Okay, so S is some scheme. And then uh, SH of S is the motivic stable homotopy category, which I assume you know about. And um, Ada is the stable Hopf map, right? So Ada is a map from sort of GM to one in SH of S, and it comes from the Hopf map, which is um, A2 minus the origin goes to P1, right? And you just desuspend it by, um, by P1. And um, this, this here means that I'm looking at those spectra where um, this map acts in isomorphism. And uh, well, it's, it's not obvious that this category is even zero, but um, for example, Morel proved that um, if S is a field, then um, sort of pi zero of the sphere in this category is the this is so-called vitring of that field, uh, which is in particular not the zero ring ever um, because it subjects onto Zima two. And um, <coughs> so it's, it's not obvious and maybe a bit surprising, but this category is not zero. And it's maybe a bit surprising for the following reason that, um, of course, there's a topological analog of this map here. And then its fourth power would be zero, right? So somehow if you invert ADA, you're, you're, you're getting away very far from classical topology somehow. And I mean, that's in some sense bad because, well, classical topology has been a helpful source of inspiration for motivic homotopy theory. But in another sense, it's sort of good because uh, there are somehow some very difficult problems about classical topology, right? Like what are the stable stems? <laughs> and they just don't seem to have a good answer. And so whenever you do something motivic, homotopy theory is going to be at least as difficult or bad or whatever as the classical problem. And well, if the classical problem is already bad, then your hopes are not very good. But in this situation, since we're somehow eliminating the classical influences, one might hope that maybe um, this will have a, an easier answer. And I think I, well, we, we show that it does in some sense. Um, so there's one assumption which I'm going to make throughout. Um, I'm going to assume that two is invertible on all of my schemes. So I'm, I'm not sure if this is necessary for the results. So I'm going to state some results. And as far as I can tell, some of them might also be true and characteristic true, but I have no idea how to prove them. And I mean, I have also no no evidence that they should be true other than, I don't know, youthful optimism. So uh, while well, you're invited to think about how to extend the results, I, I don't know right now. Okay. So now suppose you've decided you want to study this category here. There's uh, some sort of preliminary observation, which is gonna quickly focus your thoughts which is, well, whenever you try to study some sort of category, you can try to like invert some primes or complete some primes and somehow these processes are complementary to one another. So one of the um, instinctive things which you might do, you might want to invert two. So if I take this category, I've inverted eta, and let's say I also invert two. And then we know some things about sort of the Wittring and uh, Mendelwitt K theory and that sort of stuff which tells you that this is also going to be the same thing as where instead of inverting eta, you invert something called a row. And then you also invert two. 
And then the, the reason why this is useful is that somehow if you invert rho, even without inverting two, then the category becomes much simpler. So this is just going to be sheaves of spectra in the so-called real space. And then, of course, I still have to invert two. Right, so this is um, the associated real space. And it's just some topological space. Doesn't matter uh, for now what it is or for the rest of the talk. Right, and this just means sheaves of spectra in the most boring possible sense on the topological space. And I mean, what this tells you is that this category here is sort of easy in some sense. And um, so basically, if you try to understand this category and uh, you will split this problem into two parts of understanding this category and understanding some complementary category, then uh, this half is sort of already done. So this is not difficult in some sense. Okay, and so now what this means is that you need to look at um, the complementary category in some sense, all right? So we focus on SH of S eta inverted, and then maybe you invert all primes other than two, or you might be even more brutal and you just complete at two. And then the hope would be that if you understand this category or maybe this category, then you can often patch your results together with something about this category. And then you get some sort of global understanding of this entire category, um, right? And so somehow the difficult part is understanding this or this. And this is the, for this reason, I will mostly focus on that problem. Okay, so now how can, how can we do that? So there's somehow, something which you might call as a standard technique, or I don't know, sort of anachronistically. Uh, which goes as follows. So suppose that um, I start with any symmetric monoidal, I don't know, stable, presentable infinity category, something like that. Let's say symmetric monoidal infinity category. Oops, not the greatest infinity symbol. Right, and now suppose that I have any sort of diagram of ring spectra. Um, so then you can take the limit of this diagram and will still be a ring spectrum. Um, but of course, there's also the initial ring spectrum, which is the sphere, right? So there's going to be a map from the sphere in the, into this limit. So you get this sort of map. Um, Okay, and then what you hope is that you, uh, well, you, you choose your i and your e in a sufficiently clever way so that this becomes an equivalence. You somehow manage to prove that. And then you use, try to use some sort of standard techniques to understand this limit. Hope for a good choice of i and e, this is equivalence. and limit can be understood. I mean, of course I could just take the constant diagram at like one object and I choose this one object to be the sphere. And then there's obviously there's an isomorphism but this completely stupid. Um, so you need to do something clever where you can, somehow you can understand something about this E thing and then learn something about one. It's just, it's just some sort of idea or principle, it's, it's, not, it's not a recipe. So by standard, you mean like Adam spectral sequences or Adam Snowflake spectral That would be, sequences. yeah. So an Adam spectral sequence exactly is, is what I'm going to give at the next example. Yeah, so um, that's right. So that's why I would call it standard. So here's the example. Um, so I take 
i to be the simplex category. And then I fix somehow B in C alg of C. And then you put um, sort of E n uh, equals E to the tensor n plus one. Right, and this way you obtain sort of E some parameter here and it's gonna give you a functor from the simplex category to um, C H of C. And I mean, the, you have to of course explain what the maps are, but the maps are given by inserting units and by doing various multiplications and so on and so forth. And then, so this is basically sort of the standard co-simplicial resolution. And uh, well, then you obtain some maps so of one goes to the limit. And this thing then has a special name. This is called the e-nilpotent completion of the sphere. And then as Bova said, the reason why this is somehow appealing is that uh, whenever you have this sort of totalization, right? So limit over the simplex category, then one can uh, have some inductive procedure for trying to understand these homotopy groups in terms of something called the, um, the associated spectral sequence. And uh, also somehow experience shows that often this map is an equivalent. So this is, yeah, so this is sort of the more specialized version of this standard technique. Um, where, where, where this sort of idea comes from. Um, okay. So this, this works very well, for example, right? So this is an equivalence. Uh, for example, if you take C to be just a category of classical spectra, and if you let E just be MU, right? Or in fact, any connective ring spectrum such as pi zero is Z. So you could take HZ, for example, but maybe the problem with HZ is that I don't really know what the higher powers of that are. Whereas with MU, of course, you know what uh, all of these powers will be. And you exactly get then the classical atom spectral sequence converging to the homotopy groups of the sphere. I mean, this also shows you that sort of this standard techniques in some sense is very limited because, well, we don't know everything about the stable stems. We, well, we can look at the spectral sequence. We can have huge diagrams of what's going on, but yeah, I mean, we, we can just get a little bit closer than we thought maybe we could. Okay, so, so now suppose that I want to do this, of course, in the category that I'm interested in, right? So now suppose, of course, that C is going to be my eta periodic spectra. And let's say I localize it at two, right? So now if I want to play the same game, I have to choose a ring spectrum. So Let's look at some ring spectra. Right, so what could we try? Well, so one thing which one might uh, try is you take um, somehow the Hermitian K theory spectrum, right? So there's KO, which is the spectrum representing Hermitian K theory, maybe homotopy Hermitian K theory if your base is not regular, but you can also think if you want of S as just the spectrum of a field or if you have a perfect field, this problem is still difficult, right? So I'm just uh, saying we also don't gain anything for now by restricting to a field. So this is the spectrum representing Hermitian K theory. Now, of course, this is not uh, eta periodic or anything. <laughs> so I have to do something. And uh, well, I do the obvious thing. I made it make it eta periodic then I localize it at two. So that for sure would be an example of a ring spectrum. Um, so there's another name for it, which is um, KW, somehow A, right? So KO with eta inverted, this is called KW, uh, localized at two. And uh, maybe the, one of the reasons why is that the, this spectrum here, so without localizing it two, it rep represents something called, uh, well, either L groups or triangular bit groups or something like that. In the, so because in the, in the base two is inverted, all of these things are the same. So let's say Balmer with groups. 
Okay. So that's one guy which you could start with. The problem is, well, I'm going to give you a bunch of problems, but one immediate problem is that this is not connective. And I mean, neither is this one. And usually these spectral sequences, they work much better for connective objects. And for, I mean, if you take E to be connective, but okay, well, sometimes you have to do something difficult, so whatever. Um, so another class of spectra which one has is sort of coming from cobordism, right? So, I mean, I cannot take algebraic cobordism because uh, eta is zero there. So if I invert eta, that's not gonna help. But I, I can take something like symplectic cobordism. Right, so I take uh, MSL, or this is special linear cobordism, I guess. Eta inverse localized the two, or I can take MSP. Okay, so these are cobordism spectra. So these are a certain spectra which are built basically out of Grassmannians and tomb spaces of vector bundles on them. Uh, and I mean, this is, we had this example here, where, right? So you can use MU and this is somehow very successful. So this is maybe, maybe a reasonable guess that you should uh, take some cobordism spectra. And um, okay, so maybe now, maybe doing this over a general basis is too difficult. So let's uh, say I'm working over a field. Then, uh, well, at least I could take sort of connective covers, right? So I could take something called um, little kw2, which is just the connective cover. Um, I could also take somehow hw, oops. Two, just to list a few. Um, so if you want, this is somehow the zero truncation of this Ada periodic sphere, right? So this is some sort of version of uh, some sort of Albert McLean spectrum. So I have all of these, right? And now I try to run my standard technique and well, uh, big surprise, it's not gonna work. So why is it not gonna work? Well, if you want to have uh, any, any leeway with this, well, with the standard cosimplicial resolution, right? So you need to work out what all of these powers are. And I mean, best case scenario, you can sort of work it out in terms of the object which you started with. So you also need to know the homotopy groups of the object which you started with. And if you have both of these informations, then possibly you can, you can get something. So now is it gonna work? Well, so this guy here, let's say we're over a field, then um, for all of these, I know the homotopy groups. So that's a good start. But on the other hand, I have no idea what happens if I smash these objects with themselves, right? So here I do not know the cooperations and here also I don't, okay? So that the problem do not, no, oops, I can't spell cooperations, i.e. powers. Right, so this problem happens here, happens here. Well, it's the same, <laughs> it's a bit stupid. Uh, it happens, uh, I think it happens here. Yeah, I don't think we know these. Um, we don't know it here and we don't know it here. Okay, but at least for MSP, for example, we know the corporations, good start. But then we don't know the homotopy groups. <laughs> do not know pi star. So maybe I should not have um, made this red. I think that for MSL you also know cooperations, no? I mean, this is eta inverted and you go. It's eta inverted, yeah. So you've worked this out, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> yeah, so we don't know the homotopy groups. And so, well, we don't know them here and we don't know them here. And so you see, that in, no, in none of the examples that we've worked out, we know both. And so that's why you seem to have a problem, right? Um, all right, so that's of course why I, well, of course, but I gave you this uh, more general version of the standard technique, right? So where you don't have just the cosimplicial resolution, but you take any sort of diagram. And uh, so the idea is, well, okay, so the standard cosimplicial resolution doesn't work, but maybe we shouldn't despair. So let's try to build some diagram, right? And now, how do you build a diagram? Well, you need some interesting morphism. If you have a ring spectrum, there are all the sort of standard morphisms, which you could just come inserting units and multiplication, but maybe you can cook up some other morphism. Um, okay, so uh, what do you say? The, don't despair. Um, any interesting morphisms?
So do any of these objects here have interesting morphisms, right? So do you know any sort of um, cohomology operations? Um, and so the answer is, I think, that the only ones which I know off the top of my head are sort of for these um, K-theory related things. And then the interesting fact is that they have Adams operations. So the answer is uh, yes. And um, so the point is that there are Adams operations. Uh, we could call it uh, Psi uh, N maybe. It goes from something like KO, let's say this goes to KO uh, localized to two for all N, I suppose, um, odd. And so these are, um, well, they're related to the topological Adams operations and they were constructed in this form by um, um, Azel and Ojean, uh, constructed by Okay, so maybe just as a, as a brief intermission, if you haven't seen these guys, so these Adams operations, um, right? So this is somehow Hermitian, some sort of Hermitian K-theory, right? So this is in some sense related to uh, vector bundles with symmetric bilinear forms. And so these Psi N things, they are related, related to somehow exterior powers of vector bundles in, in some way. of vector bundles. And I mean, you can put symmetric bilinear forms on them or anti-symmetric with bilinear form. Okay, and then there's another way of thinking about this, which is that let's say if S is uh, spec K, right? So then um, pi star of K O is just gonna be the growth and dequittering of K at join. Uh, this is not correct. So maybe I do this. by two star star. So if I would periodize it, it would also be correct. Um, no, it's also not correct. So let me do the width version, then it's, then it's better. Okay, so pi star of kw is just the vitring of k adjoined beta beta inverse, where um, beta has degree four. And then what does the psi n do? It turns out that um, sort of psi n is, uh, is the identity on the which ring, so it doesn't do anything. So psi n um, fixes w of k. So then you need to know what it does with beta because it's a ring homomorphism. And psi n of beta, it turns out is um, n squared times beta. Yeah, I think that's correct. Right, so if, if you don't know what this is, at least you know sort of what it does on homotopy groups in the periodic setting. Uh, in the eta periodic setting, which is of course what we want. Uh, right. So one fact is that uh, sort of if you do psi n and then you do psi m, that's just the same thing as doing psi n times m, right? So I guess you can also see this here. You've just multiplied beta by n squared. Now you multiply it by m squared. Of course, the same thing as multiplying it by n m squared. Um, and so what this tells you is that uh, you do get a diagram of ring spectra, right? So the ring spectrum is, let's say, KW, localized to two, um, right? So you see that uh, beta is invertible, right? So on beta inverse, you have to multiply by n to the minus two. So this n guy better be invertible on your spectrum. So that's why I need it to be odd. Um, in any case, right? So you get this diagram of ring spectra and the category which acts, right? So, so we therefore we get somehow BG goes via Adams operation to um, CH of um, SH of S beta inverse localized at two, right? So where G is um, odd integers under multiplication. Right, so what does uh, this category mean? It just has one object and then, which is maybe star, and then the endomorphisms of that object are given by, well, the odd integers with multiplication, right? So star somehow goes to um, 
kw let's say this guy and sort of n from star to star and then i map this to psi n all right so now we've got a very different category than the one which we uh, were starting out with right so <laughs> it's no longer the simplex category it's just this this um, classifying space of this weird group. Um, but on the other hand, right? Well, not on the other hand, though, just uh, to go and continue with the story, right? So let's stare at this formula here. We're observing that on homotopy groups, it just multiplies by n squared, right? And we said that n squared is invertible. So it tells you that this psi n operation is actually an automorphism of, um, of the bit uh, kw, right? So note. Psi n kw2 to kw2 is an automorphism. And what this tells you is that in this action which we have here, we can group complete um, G. And then what we get is. Um, sort of um, the units in uh, Z localized at two, right? Okay, so it's not really clear where this is going, but uh, well, bear with me. Um, so one other thing which I could do is I could, I could complete this KW spectrum instead of localizing it. Uh, so let me complete it at two. And it turns out that then somehow you can take limits of your Adams operations and you don't just get them for, um, for integers, you can get them for two attic integers. So this is non-trivial and also not really necessary for the rest of the proof, but I think it, it motivates uh, what we're going to do. Okay, so replace KW2 by kw to adequately complete it. And it turns out we get an extension to um, b z to adequately complete it. And then the units in that. So let me just write this. All right, so this, this thing here, this just means two adic integers. Okay. like this. And um, it also turns out, so this is much easier to see that um, psi minus one x trivially. So again, I'm, I'm not going to justify this, but basically the idea is that psi minus one is related to taking duals of vector spaces, right? Or line by uh, vector bundles. And uh, Hermitian K-theory is related to things which have an isomorphism with its dual, a special kind of isomorphism with its dual. So almost sort of by definition, it should be the case that um, taking the dual of some symmetric bilinear space is just the same thing in Hermitian, it's like the identity in Hermitian K-theory. And so this is why the psi, psi minus one shouldn't do anything, right? And so then therefore we actually get um, sort of V of Z to unit modulo plus minus one goes to charge of whatever. All right. So now for this, this last thing, yeah, Tom, sorry. Uh, for this last thing that psi minus one, that's trivially, you don't need to complete or do anything. No, 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 I did not need that at all. This was true from the beginning. Okay. That's right, sorry. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay. But so now um, the group of units in uh, Z2 is uh, is, is well understood, right? So you have the sort of units of finite order, which is exactly plus minus one. And then you have some group, which is isomorphic to um, Z2 itself by some sort of exponential map, but perhaps not canonically because you need to choose a generator. But of course you could also canonically choose one like three, but in any case, um, so this uh, note that this Z2 units modulo plus minus one, this is, a um, Z2 module uh, free of rank one. Okay. So if I pick a generator, right? 
right? Uh, for example, three works. Um, and so then what you do is, um, so consider, well, so I'm starting with my ADA periodic to ideally completed sphere. And then I'm mapping it, of course, by my standard technique to the limit over B, Z, two cross modulo plus minus one of um, KW to ideally completed, right? So this is what I said. Um, well, we've written down as many sort of morphisms as we could think of. And this, this way we've made the biggest possible diagram involving only KW. So it's like the most complicated thing I could uh, think of. And then uh, well, I would hope that maybe this is closer to this ADA periodic sphere, right? And then it turns out uh, this is actually equivalent to the limit of BZ of um, KW to ideally completed. And here I'm using this map, right? So Z goes to um, Z2 cross modulo plus minus one. And this is equivalent, of course, to the Z2 we said uh, on G and the map is G, right? So this is basically just picking out a dense uh, subgroup of this um, profinite cyclic group here. And then there's uh, some sort of standard trickery in topology that uh, basically that, um, right? So B, Z, if I triadically complete this, you get um, B, Z triadically completed. And I mean, in fact, this is just the sphere, the, the circle, of course, triadically completed. Oops. Okay. So instead of doing this complicated huge limit, I just do a limit over a circle. And now, of course, a limit over a circle is very easy because the circle is just a push out, right? So it's just uh, take two points and then like this. And so the limit over the circle can always be computed. This is just a fiber. So the fiber, oops, oh my God, my spelling's going into the toilet. The fiber of KW to adequately completed goes by Psi G minus one of KW to adequately completed. Right, so that's just how you compute the limit over BZ. And that's also what the limit over this big category is that we thought is the biggest we could think of. And uh, now we're getting something <laughs> very, very concrete, right? So now it's just a fiber of some stupid map. So that looks much more approachable. And let me call this guy here, sort of J couple, uh, J upper space W. Um, okay. And now we could hope maybe that this is a good approximation, but to some extent, clearly it isn't, right? So it's what I said before that um, this guy here was periodic. I mean, not just eta periodic, but sort of beta periodic. So it has negative homotopy groups and this one is not. So this, this can't possibly be right. But on the other hand, we can totally com we can completely work out the homotopy groups of this, right? So work out, we may work out um, pi star of uh, JW from what I've told you before, right? So we get, um, what do we get? Well, the homotopy groups of this thing is either the vitring here to adequately completed um, or zero, right? So in all degrees divisible by four, you get the vitring and otherwise you get zero. And so what this means is that you get some endomorphism of this vitring or some, 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 some map from the vitring to itself. It's not a ring homomorphism anymore, it's a module homomorphism. And then you see the kernel and the co-kernel of that map. And um, so this is what's gonna happen in degrees congruent to three or four uh, or zero mod four. And uh, the map, well, with the map we also know, right? Where is it here? It's just, it multiplies, right? So the psi thing, uh, just multiplies beta by n squared, right? So, and then it's just the map which multiplies by n squared minus one. So let's see. So what we get, is we get either the kernel or the co-kernel of this map, vitring um, g to the two n minus one, I suppose. And, um, or you get zero. So you get the kernel if um, star, I guess is congruent to zero mod four, uh, I guess, concurrent to, 
I guess if star is equal to four and, and the co-kernel if star is equal to four n minus one and zero s. Okay, so we found this approximation of the sphere or something which you hope might be an approximation. And in some sense, it's very good because we know all of the homotopy groups. But in some sense, it's also obviously wrong because this thing here has homotopy groups in negative degrees and this one does not. Okay, so, so this cannot be um, pi star of the eta periodic sphere because um, pi, well, I mean, this is equal to zero. star is less than zero. And I mean, this is not, <laughs> oops. Okay, but so now if, we're, if we already have our extremely optimistic heads on, then you would say, well, maybe this is correct in non-negative degrees. All right, so uh, maybe sort of um, the eta periodic sphere Theoretically completed. Maybe this is um, you take this guy, and then you take the connective cover. Well, I I don't know why not. And uh, well, actually there is there there is a why not here, or there's a why here. But because uh, I'm not, we did right. So Mike and I we did not work on this problem in a vacuum. Other people have thought about it before, and so when we were working on this, you we we, we knew what the answer was here for the reals and for the complex numbers and uh, for the rationals. And um, well, it takes uh, maybe my, my Hopkins or other people to spot that um, the answer which they get in these cases is indeed this. I mean, it is indeed this. So in fact, by work of um, you may, no, not you, Meg, you, Isaacson, Andrews Miller, and um, Glenn Wilson. They suggest, well, I mean, sort of the left hand side and the right hand side are just have the same homotopy groups. It's not immediately clear that the map is uh, also an isomorphism, but um, they suggest that this is true for K. equals, well, C is, I guess, Andrews Miller, R is Q Isaacson, and uh, Q is Wilson. Um, all right, so then uh, you feel like you're on a good track, right? So maybe maybe this is just always true. The question, of course, also is uh, how on earth do you prove it? But uh, hmm. so it turns out that, um, that there is, a, there is somehow an alternative and more helpful formulation. So we will see maybe in a second why it is more helpful. Um, so there's an alternative formulation. Where still, I mean, I'm working over fear. And um, so there you do the following thing. You look at little kW, and I mean, it's just the connective cover of kW, like this. And now you have this Adams operation, kW2 goes by psi g minus one to kW2. Um, but then you also have somehow this bod element beta, and there's a sigma four kW2 here. And then the cofiber is HW2, or I mean, you want it's just it's just the vitring, right? So the Albert McLean spectrum corresponding to the vitring. And you can compute this composite here, and you easily see that it's zero, basically because well the psi thing acts trivially on the vitring, right? So this we we wrote this up here somewhere. Here I claim well, I mean at least I claimed it. And you can also actually you can easily see this. Um, and the reason is that there's a map, right? So by the way, you have this map from the sphere, let's say it inverted goes to uh, let's say kw or whatever right so on pi zero here you get the vitring and uh, on pi zero here you also get the vitring and it's the same right 
but whenever you have any map whatsoever, right? So this, let's say to KW, then on homotopy, you will always get a, um, a module structure um, over this vitring. And um, so somehow the reason that, and, and, and I mean, on the sphere, it must be trivial, basically is what I'm saying. And the operation must be trivial on the sphere. Um, because it's, for example, because it's by ring homomorphisms, right? So you do this sort of thing, one goes to KW, goes to KW, Psi, right? And this is, this is the same map. And here you have your operation, this commutes, and then you, you learn that it couldn't possibly do anything. But I mean, in any case, so that this easily tells you that it was zero here, and it tells you that then that there exists lift here. And it turns out by some uh, more careful, uh, um, by some more careful uh, thinking about this problem, that there is an in fact unique lift here. Let's call it maybe phi up and G. Okay, so that's uh, how you can build this thing. So what one may show. Do you mean unique as some structured map? No, this is now it's purely a map of spectra and it's unique up to homotopy as a map of spectra. It has no structure anymore. Okay, so, so saying that on pi one uh, of wheat, this also acts trivially or somehow the action on pi one leads uh, to, to the action on the whole KW. Well, I mean, so far I have not really the... done anything, right? So it's not obvious immediately that this map is zero. I've just said that on pi zero, somehow it's zero, right? So I. If you want, I had um, the sphere here like this. And what I've really shown is that this composite is zero. And then- Right, and then pi zero, yeah. Yeah, but then you the, the point is that this guy is zero truncated, right? So you can truncate this guy and then you just get the same as the truncation of this guy. So then you learn that this composite, I mean, that this composite truly is zero. And then you learn that truly there is a morphism. And then, I mean, the obstruction to the uniqueness is that you put some sigma inverse W here, right? And then you need to check that maps from now to here are zero. And then you can still do this because this, um, right? Because sigma inverse W is minus one truncated and then the minus one truncation of this is zero. So you, you find this zero by sort of T-structure argument. I mean, you, you get this unique, right, right. relatively easy T-structure argument, but completely unstructured. Yes. So, so there exists this phi thing. And, um, so in fact, the fiber, so I did this now in the localization, but I can of course also complete this. So let's say the fiber of pi G and you complete it. I mean, you can just work out all the homotopy groups just as we did before with the other thing, which was called phi, right? Uh, with the psi, right? So we had this, you have this super explicit map. You can work out what it does on all homotopy groups and you just compute what they are. And you just find that it's the same thing as um, sort of this, this guy, which we were hoping is right. Um, and so maybe this guy here is called little jw. And the j is somehow because it's related in some, I don't know, philosophical or practical way to something called the image of j spectrum in topology, which is well, it's built as the fiber of some Adams operation um, in any case. Um, so you have this, this guy and it's somehow just a different uh, formulation, right? So then, then there's an obvious question, um, which is that, is this map, is this an equivalence? And I mean, the other question is, can you extend this picture to um, things which are not fields? Okay, and so now, let, oh, so I was claiming that uh, somehow this alternative formulation here is better. So let me just uh, for a second say why, right? So why? is alternative formulation better. 
right? So it's because um, we have a fiber sequence. Um, one eta inverted localized to two goes to kw localized to two goes to sigma four kw localized to two. So we've seen, I mean, this expresses exactly the same thing, right? So this is if and only if one eta inverse two is equivalent to somehow this JW guy greater than or equal to zero. But now that we have it written as a fiber sequence like this, I can smash it with any spectrum whatsoever and it remains a fiber sequence, right? So therefore you get sort of E eta inverse localized to two goes to KW um, to smash E goes to um, sigma four, oops. KW to smash E like this. And so this means that um, if you want to compute, let's say the homotopy groups of this thing here or of any spectrum, right? I mean, eta periodic to local spectrum, what you have to do is you have to work out it's KW, little KW homology and the effect of this um, homology operation phi G. And um, so this is, well, I guess I said it's equivalent to the thing which we had before, but somehow this is much, uh, much more applicable, right? Because then you can stick in some other spectra which you want to know something about like algebraic cobordism, well, syntactic cobordism, something like that. And you can try to do this kind of computation. Um, yeah, so that's why this is better. Um, and so then the last thing is that from now on, I'm going to put um, G equal to three. So you can take different choices. I think five maybe is also a pre pretty conventional choice, but from now on, I'm just going to fix this one. Um, okay, so that, that concludes my uh, introduction section on uh, how might one come up with this. Um, any questions so far? Uh, so in the last reformulation and in general with this, uh, truncation thing you couldn't reformulate it in terms of any limit so you couldn't um, you could you couldn't somehow you could actually you could. i mean first of all it's the fiber of something of course so that uh yeah but this is this uses the generator so this is not ah, there yes no you, you you could also do this okay well i mean since you asked about it let me tell you so this is completely irrelevant for i mean but this, it's a good question yeah so you could also say the following could observe that, um, so let's say Z2 units mod plus minus one, right? So this acts on KW to adequately complete it. But this guy here, it maps of course to its pi zero, right? Which is HW to adequately complete it. And here on this guy, the action is trivial. Mm -hmm. So then what you obtain is you get the following kind of diagram. You take B of um, Z2 cross mod plus minus one. And then I'm adding sort of a cone. So let me write this, right? And this now goes to C alg of uh, whatever, right? And it's the, the, it, right? So this thing, this category here has two objects, right? So it has sort of star and then it has whatever the other thing is. And then the isomorphisms of here is this sort of Z2 cross modulo plus minus one. And this guy here only has the identity. And then there's another map to here and uh, like everything commutes, right? It's just, you, you added the, this cone point. And uh, so this right. is gonna map to, well, KW to adequately complete it goes to HW to adequately complete it. And I think if you, so Robert Berklund told me this and I think he's probably right. Um, if you take the limit of this category you exactly recover basically this thing. I mean, you basically recover this. Cool. Oh. So let's call this functor, I don't know, E. Right, so there is still an invariant formulation um, 
which is, uh, is, is good for some things, but yeah, so I'm not going to focus on that. Anything else? Okay, so then uh, I will I will try to I will try to explain how to answer these questions here. So that's what the remainder of my talk is about. Of course, uh, so I understand that there's not really a time limit here, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, so I will right. So I will basically I will just uh, I will first try to answer how how this one do this, and then I will try to answer how this one do this, and then maybe I will be too tired at some point, and then that's that's going to be the end. Um, and if you want to, well, if you want to know something specific, then of course ask me uh, anytime. But um, right. So what I will first try to do is how to extend this picture to to more general base schemes. And somehow the point is that. I mean, these two questions are in some sense orthogonal. If you can answer, yeah, we, we will see, right? So basically they're, they're, they're completely complementary and well, I would just do them in this order because whatever reason. We also could do them in the other order. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so this is now we're done with the introduction. So now what's, what's the point, right? So the point is we have this spectrum, little kw, which is defined over fields in terms of the homotopy T structure. It has lots of good properties. It has, um, it has this Adams action, it's stable under base change, um, and uh, it, it has this modified Adams action with the little phi instead of the capital or whatever. Um, so now we want something like this over a general base, right? So we want We want some spectrum, which we call little kw, and should sit in, should be a commutative ring, let's say, in SH of S, like this. And we also want this map phi from kw to sigma 4, well, maybe to I think local sigma 4 kw to local. And then we have, uh, obviously, we have some properties that we require. Well, certainly what we want is that this composite if I go via the unit map to kw2, let's say, and then I go to sigma4 kw2, this should be null. Let's say it is null homotopic. Maybe also we want a specific choice of null homotopy or something like that, but okay, let's see what we can then get. And then of course, the point is that if we have this, then I can map into the fiber, right? And the, this map maps automatically to the fiber of this operation here. And um, so you have this comparison map. And what I want is that the pullback to fields recovers the previous construction. I.e., right, so I, I.e., if I take like um, alpha from spec K to S, then alpha upper star of S is isomorphic to, um, let's say, kW over k, greater than or equal to zero, just to, to make it clear, right? So this is what I called little kW over k before, but uh, just, just to be clear. And so the alpha upper star of phi should be the thing which we called phi before. Um, okay, and now and once you have this, um, you will also learn that this is basically a, well, if you can prove that this is a fiber sequence in the case of fields, then you will automatically get that this is also a fiber sequence here. Um, because, well, in order to check this, well, I guess you want also stability under base change. But basically, usually you can check if something is an isomorphism by checking it after pullback to fields, and you will know it's true over fields. So that's why I say it's, um, it's an author, so sort of two complementary problem. Um, so, okay, so this is like the, the the definite things that we want, and I guess I will, you will get some uh, bonus points. Bonus points. Um, if KW is uh, stable under base change, maybe also phi stable under base change. Right, so here I've only required that it should be stable under base change to fields in some sense, and now I want it to be stable under everything. And um, if we know, let's say, the, um, um, the, the homotopy groups 
and of course the action by phi. Because then, I mean, if you put everything together, right? So you have this guy, you have this fiber sequence, you know, the homotopy groups, you can basically work out what the homotopy groups of the eta periodic sphere are um, over, well, two local, over, um, uh, so maybe let me put this here, um, over, over this, for this space scheme S, right? And, and to some extent, maybe this, it's not the only thing which you can possibly ask about the um, eta periodic um, homotopy category, but I feel like that's, that's a very natural question. And also notice that, I mean, as I said in the beginning, um, in topology, this question is like completely unanswerable, what are the stable stems? But here we have a we have a nice sort of closed formula. Okay, there's like the kernel and the co-kernel of multiplication by some numbers on the vitring is not necessarily very easy, but it's much, much more explicit than classically, right? Okay, so now how do we possibly construct this guy? Now, remember that in the case of fields, I just said, well, you take the, connective cover into homotopy T structure. So the obvious guess is um, we take, um, well, well, so you observe that SH of S uh, greater than or equal to zero. So this is the non-negative part of the homotopy T structure. Structure, right? So this is generated by sigma infinity plus um, x smash gm to the smash n, where x is in smooth s and um, n is in z, right? So this, this makes sense over any field, or over any base. Right, and so it means that I can just take my capital KW guy, I take the connective cover, why, why not? Right. Well, the the, the and, uh, I mean actually it will turn out that this is the correct answer at least if uh, S is the um, is a, is a data kin domain or a field, but um, so there are problems with this. There are big problems with this, <laughs> and so the problems is that if you're not over a field, the homotopy T structure is really not particularly well behaved. So you have homotopy groups, of course, or even homotopy sheaves, but it's not at all the case that if I take something like the connective cover of a spectrum, um, then the homotopy sheaves of that guy will be just the same homotopy sheaves as the previous guy, just only in concentrated in degree greater than equal to zero, and then that the negative homotopy sheaves will be zero. So this is related to the failure of what's called um, the stable connectivity conjecture. And I mean, it's, ju it's, just, true, uh, it's just false in positive dimension. Um, I think it's even known to be false in dimension one. So, I mean, it's just not true in general. So this just doesn't work. So the problem is that we do not know, or I mean, do we not know a priori what the sort of pi star of KW is? Um, so this was uh, listed as the bonus point. So maybe that's not uh, immediately too bad, but so then therefore we do not know if the cofiber of beta on this guy is co-connected. And you see the co-connectivity of this guy this was used here in the construction of phi. I very much used that this thing here is co-connected or co-connective, whatever the word is for me, the degree is less than or equal to zero. And so what this means is that we then cannot construct phi or again, not, don't know how to construct phi. So you used it to see that uh, the map is unique or? No, I mean. Yeah. In general, right, so we had yeah, we can do this sort of thing, right? We have kw two for sure. Then we do psi minus one kw two, and then I have my kw uh, two sigma four here, and then I have my beta here. Oops, my spelling is getting out of hand. I have my beta here, right? And then whatever this cofiber is, I mean, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, Actually. right. And so I need to show that this map is zero, and in order to show that, I use the fact that this guy is less than or equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Right, because I can put the unit here and I know that this is zero. 
but it does not imply that this is zero unless you know somehow that this guy is less than or equal to zero. Yeah, okay, thanks. And uh, so we need to know, well, I mean, maybe there are other ways of doing this, but uh, so when I thought about this problem, how to generalize it to, to other bases, this is like the, the obvious thing which I tried and it doesn't work for exactly this reason. And um, so the other point is that even if this would work, we wouldn't immediately know that this guy is stable under base change. Right, so the, the homotopy T structure, sort of truncation is compatible, I guess, with essentially smooth base change or something like that. But surely I want to pull back to something like a close point. So this, I mean, would not be allowed. So it will turn out that it, it works in this case. <laughs> it's a bit of a miracle. I, I would be very happy if you could give me a good reason why it works. But um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not formal. This may be what I'm saying. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna solve this problem. It's just gonna be like its own thing, the solution, and uh, it's gonna use something very cool, which is uh, called framed correspondences. And it's gonna use that in maybe a slightly surprising way. Um, okay, so don't have time to tell you in detail about the. Uh, story and history of framed correspondences. So I will just give you a very, um, very high level overview of what's going to happen. So let me recall that there is this category core frame of S. So this is going to be some infinity category. In fact, it's symmetric monoidal. And the objects are the smooth schemes. And then the morphisms are what's called, well, tangentially framed correspondences between these things. So the morphisms is uh, tangentially framed correspondences. Okay, so in pictures, okay, I have some X, I have some Y, and they're both in smooth S. Now, how do I give a morphism in this category? But you choose some Z which is whatever, a scheme. And then you choose a morphism to here and you choose a morphism to here. And you need this morphism here to be what's called finite syntomic. And then you need some extra data tau. And the tau is what's called a well, a tangential framing. <laughs> and what it means is that tau is what you do with the following. So this is maybe called F here. You look, or not even, let's not call it F. You look at um, the cotangent complex of Z over X, cotangent complex. And uh, because this map was finite atomic, this is going to be a perfect complex. And then you look at its image sort of in the K theory space. So let me write something like this. And then you should, you, what you do is you must, you must give me a path in the K-theory space from this cotangent complex um, to the zero in the K-theory space of Z. Okay, and now if you give me all of this data, then it turns out that you have given me a morphism between X and Y in this category. And then there's some way of composing these and some way uh, the symmetric monoidal structure is just basically taking products but um, why well, I have to also do something with the morphisms and with the cotangent complexes and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's very complicated in a, in a way, but well, if you look through rose colored glasses, it's basically some stupid category of correspondences. Um, and uh, why do we care? The, well, once you have a category of correspondences, you can sort of play the standard motives game. So you have the category of, the, the category of framed spaces, spaces, frame spaces, and you do what you always do with the category of correspondences, right? So you look at um, um, sigma pre-sheaves. Um, so this means the sifted co-continuous completion or the free sifted co-continuous completion or another way, some like the relative uh, simplicial pre-sheaves on this category or something like that. I, I trust you know what it means uh, or it doesn't really matter too much. 
And then you do the motivic localization, right? So it means you invert, um, you make the affine line contractible, you invert the Nisnevich equivalence, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, so that's, that's, that's what the category of frame motivic spaces. And then there's also the category of S1 spectra. And this is just going to be where instead of sigma pre sheaves, you to take spectral pre sheaves. So. Right, so this just means um, pre sheaves of spectra. Um, okay, so let's leave it at that. And then there's also the category of um, framed just spectra, so SH framed of S. And this is just, you start with them um, framed spaces and then you invert the object corresponding to P1. So let me just write P1 inverse, just you know what this means. And it's also the same thing as taking um, S1 spectra and inverting GM. Of course, you could also invert P1 in this category. Well, it's, it's always the same thing. Um, and now this thing, um, it, it's going to have a functor, a forgetful functor in a sense to ordinary motivic spectra. And it turns out that this is an equivalence. So um, as I said, I'm not going to be too fuzzy about to giving citations, but so what the dots here mean basically is, um, so what Mark proves essentially is that if this construction gives you an equivalence for perfect fields, then it will give you an equivalence for all schemes. And how do you know that it gives you an equivalence for perfect fields? Well, that's where you need um, a lot more of the framed uh, correspondence story, but at the end, uh, one, one knows this. Okay. Okay. Um, right, so that's that's maybe my high level overview of framed correspondences. And uh, so now, now I'm going to try and use this in a, well, as I said, maybe slightly obscure way. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first show you an interesting framed correspondence. Well, so it's going to be from A1 minus zero and it's going to just go to the point I mean, S if you want, right? And so now what do I have to do? I have to give you, I have to give you this thing which I put in the little roof and I have to give you this trivialization. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put here also A1 minus zero. <laughs> and then of course there's a, there's a unique map here because uh, well, star is terminal. And so you could uh, take some map here and you say, well, of course, Tom, you have to take some interesting automorphism like multiplication by unit or something, but um, I'm actually just going to take the identity. <laughs> Okay, and then you need, um, I need to, of course, to put this tau here. And I mean, if this is supposed to be interesting at all, then the tau has to be interesting, right? And so what I do, um, tau, well, it should be some path, right? In the K-theory space, somehow from the point of the cotangent complex. Now the cotangent complex of the identity or any finite tau morphism, if you want, this is actually canonically uh, zero, right? just some fact somehow. And then on the other end, I'm supposed to make a path from this guy to zero. But it was already zero, right? So it's just a, it's just a loop in the K-theory space. So is a loop in the K-theory of A1 minus zero. Um, all right. And um, so how do you produce loops? There's a standard way of doing that. Um, so any unit will give you such a loop, not just a homotopy class of a loop, although I guess in my case that would be enough, but it actually does give you a loop. But in any case, so I can certainly give you a unit given by um, the image of well, some unit, uh, units on A1 minus zero cross. And now which unit am I gonna take? Well, of course, the most obvious, most important unit of A1 minus zero is whatever the tautological unit, let me call it T, right? So this is like 
K T T inverse, and that's that's the unit T. So this produces some map. And so some, some interesting frame correspondence, right? Now, what could it be? It turns out, and I mean, if you know about uh, these things, then it's probably not super surprising, but it turns out that you have the following lemma. Um, the induced map, where I take sort of the one one sphere, and I can include this in some sense into sigma infinity frame of a one minus zero, right? So, right, so now I'm using implicitly this equivalence here, I suppose. And uh, notice that sigma infinity framed of a one minus zero sort of means sigma infinity plus of a one minus zero. So it's not the same thing as s one one, but uh, has s one one as a summit. Okay, and then it's going to map to um, sigma infinity framed of star, which is s zero, or the unit frame. Let's write that. Okay, so I've produced some map from G M to one in the talk about the eta periodic sphere. So of course it's gonna it's gonna be eta. Okay, so now this is very interesting because we've produced basically a map of framed spaces if you want, or maybe framed S1 spectra if you wanted to take the summons, which corresponds to eta. And notice that one of the well, if you if you work in this field, one of the really annoying things is that there is not a map sort of from GM down to the point which corresponds to eta. There's a map from GM smash GM to M uh, to GM which corresponds to the suspension of eta. Um, basically, because I told you, it's the Hopf map, or you can also think of it as coming from the multiplication. But there's not this desuspended map. It's not a map of spaces. But if you add the frame correspondences. Then, then it acquires that, that. Then somehow this map has appeared. And this is the only reason why I do, why I use frames. And I think you can probably find a smaller and maybe nicer or more approachable category of correspondences, which has all the same good properties that we need. But well, in any case, you can do it with the frame correspondence. So I'm going to write, oops, also ADA from sort of S11 inside um, sigma infinity frame, sort of the S1 suspension um, of A1 minus zero goes to one um, in S1 frame spectra. Okay. And um, so now here's what is, I think, basically a standard move, but maybe not, not as well known as it should be. Um, which is that I can I, I will now localize this category at eta. Okay, this is done as follows: we call e in sh s one framed of s eta local. Um, if for all f in sh s one framed of f uh, of s, the the sort of pullback on mapping spaces. So I do maps from uh, from f to e, and then I do maps and I pull back along eta maps from um, sigma one one f to e, right? And this should be an iso or an equivalence of spaces or whatever. Okay, and then we put the eta local subcategory. So I denote it like this, the subcategory of ADA local spectra or objects. Um, and so it turns out that, that the, this includes, of course, into SH S1 framed of S. And it turns out that this has a symmetric monoidal left adjoint. So this is really is a localization. Let me maybe give it a different color. Let's call it a letter. Like this. Okay. And so now, uh, now we come to the point uh, of the move, the corollary, which is pretty easy, is that a letter SH S1 framed 
of S is just equivalent to SH of S eta inverted. So this category, which we set out to study, you can actually describe it like this. And um, so I think this is actually by itself already a very interesting, if not particularly difficult result. And um, the reason is the following. The way the SH of S is built, right, is that um, you take, um, let's say, pre-sheaves or maybe frame pre-sheaves or whatever, and then you invert S1 and you invert GF. And uh, well, if, if you're involved in this business, then you know that sort of inverting S1 is reasonably well understood and you can sort of deal with that. But inverting GM is where like all the murder and mayhem happens and it's really complicated. And I mean, of course, it's a very important process because well, it does, it does some very interesting things, but it's really, really hard to understand. And um, so the feeling is that in the ADA periodic category, right? So in some sense, the inversion of GM was a bit stupid or trivial in some, uh, somehow. Because of course, GM is equivalent to the unit there. So the, how can the GM still be interesting? And so now this category here, right? It does not involve inverting GM in any sort of monoidal sense, right? It's just the localization in the usual sense. So that in some sense, this category here is much more accessible than this one. Of course, they're equivalent, so it's not really a meaningful statement, but um, yeah. So that's why I think this is a very important result. And it also sort of explains why uh, in a second, this category, this description will be helpful for us. On the other hand, for sort of in the in the fields case, to prove that you actually have this equivalence, I've not found this equivalence. I mean that we have this fiber sequence, right? So I've not found this equivalence to be at all helpful. It's just completely pointless. I don't know, maybe not, but right. So I've not been able to use this. So somehow this doesn't tell you everything. Um, so let me. Well, I'm not. There, Greg. Yeah, I wanted to ask some. I don't know. A walk, very vague walk question. Sure, sure. So, I mean, uh, you have this frame stuff on the left. So, in some sense, it stands for some GM stabilization or something like that. So, I mean, it is not ordinary category of S1 spectra. It has some GM stabilization built inside. So. Right. Yeah, but in any case, this equivalence looks very interesting, of course. But, I mean, there is some gem stabilization. I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not completely already. unexpected, that's true. But you know that, for example, over, over a general base, you do not know if cancellation holds. And it's probably yeah, not, yeah, true. Right? So the GM cancellation still does something. And what this is saying here that you don't need somehow this GM stabilization. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. um, okay, so I wanted to pr say something about the proof, but so I just basically want to say this is not difficult, right? So this is a formal consequence. And I mean, if you want to see how, then look at the paper, but it's a formal consequence of the fact that, um, well, SH of S is SH framed of S, which is of course difficult, which is why I call it the corollary, and the fact that S11 is symmetric. So in SH, um, S1 framed of S. Yes. What do you mean by being asymmetric? Well, it means that the um, cyclic permutation on three copies of this guy is homotopic to the identity. Okay. So of course for S21, this is always true. And then for S11, it's true as soon as you invert S1, which is why I said it's mm -hmm. true S1. Yeah, sure. And then this is just some, some formal playing around with some kind of localization and uh, inversion and something like that. All right. So now how are we going to use this? Well, I want to use this eventually to produce somehow the little kw and well, to produce it in a manageable way. And so I'm going to use the following theorem of um, Jeremy Jacobson. And so what uh, this is going to require is that S is a Dedekind scheme. Which I suppose uh, means that it is um, locally noetherian theory and regular of dimension one, something like that. Um, 
finite uh, disjoint union of spectra of Dedekind domains. Um, and I take W underlined to be the Nesnevich sheafification of the pre sheaf W. And this is going to be a sheaf of a being groups or rings if you want on smooth S. Right, so this means the pre sheaf of with rings. And I mean, because I mean, as always, I'm assuming that two is invertible, right? So there's no discussion about what this means. It's a, that's only one sensible definition, and that's what it is. Um, okay, and then what what happens, which is not obvious, that then this this guy is strictly homotopy invariant. So it's Navish cohomology is homotopy invariant, A1 invariant, let's say A1 invariant. And basically it's sort of ADA periodic. So um so I'm going to just say that, and sort of, if I take the cohomology of let's say x times gm with coefficients in this w guy, this is going to be the same thing as the cohomology of x with coefficients in w plus h star. Should be two copies of that, yeah. And this is because, right? Because somehow this is um, it's not x smash gm is x times gm, so it's x plus x smash gm and so one of these summons is sort of stupid and the other one is interesting um and so anyhow so uh, this this can be deduced from work of jeremy jacobson basically um having to do with the fact that if two is invertible then somehow w this is sort of rigid which means that if you do this on a on a hensilian local ring you just get the same thing as the residue field and somehow for the residue fields of course you know something like this and then you can eventually you can fight your way up and you can get this sort of result. But um, it's not it's not totally trivial. Okay. But so because I'm I need to use this result of Jacobson, I'm from now on gonna assume that S is a Dedekind scheme. Um, so everything will immediately hold if you're essentially smooth over a Dedekind scheme, but um, so some of the things that I was going to say, they're, they're, they're not obviously true for a general basis. Um, and this is this is why this assumption is needed. So I'm not sure if this is right. I mean, it might be that this result here is just true in more generality, but I don't know uh, how to prove that. So from now on, S is a Dedekind scheme. All right, so now here, here I'm going to give you the construction. So we put, let's say, KO tilde. This is just omega infinity framed of KO. Um, so KO, of course, is in SH of S. And we sort of agree that we know what this guy is and it's stable in the base range and whatever. And uh, so this is going to live, this is going to be some frame for typic space. Right? I mean, it just means you take. Um, you take the infinite loop space of KO, and then you observe that this automatically has frame transfers. Uh, in particular, you know what um, what what sort of the underlying motivic space is, right? Because you know what the un infinite loop space of KO is, is the um, orthogonal Grassmannian. Um, the underlying space is um, GRO cross. See, I suppose this is due to a um, Schlichting tree party. And I'm not going to write this because I don't know how to spare the second name of, uh, off the top of my head. Um, and so you see this guy in particular is just a Grassmannian, right? So it's stable under base change. And therefore, by an argument uh, due to Mark Oyoa, you learn that this KO tilted thing is stable under base change. And I mean, the argument is that um, base change of framed spaces commutes with the forgetful functor, which is not obvious, but um, well, so I can, I can also explain to you why, but uh, let's just uh, assume some facts, right? <laughs> let's believe something. And then I put um, KW tilde, and I just let this be um, omega infinity framed of K or KW. Now, of course, 
little k uh, capital kw is uh, just the co-limit right so this is just going to be the co-limit of um k o tilde maps to k o tilde uh, no maps to gm loops k o tilde maps to gm loops of k o tilde maps to dot 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 keeps going like this and the map is a dab a star um and so this is just um k o tilde so let me denote it by this um so let me note that, right, so here that this ADA, right, so it means some map of framed spaces and the map is the map which I've constructed before, right? So we cannot even make sense of this without going um, into frame correspondences. I mean, of course, there is going to be a map, right? So even if I just look at the underlying space, there's going to be a map like this induced by sort of ADA in the stable category. But the fact that it's somehow some map which comes internally from, right? So that it's really pulled back along some map which exists for all frame spaces. That's the non-trivial thing. And that's why I showed you this element ADA before. Um, okay. So now what I will do is, oops. We let E be the S1 suspension spectrum of this guy. So sigma infinity frame of S1 of KW tilde in SH S1 framed of S. Right? So I mean, there's a factor just from, um, well, I told you, well, I didn't, but from, from frame motivic spaces to frame motivic S1 spectra, which is S1 stabilization. And one can do the following thing. So this is where you use um, a Jacobson's theorem is that you can work out the homotopy sheaves of E. Um, so pi star of E is gonna be, you take the sheaf of fit rings and you're joined beta. And notice, I mean, implicitly here, what it says is that pi star is zero if uh, star is less than zero. And the other fact is that this is ADA local. Right, and so the proof is that you use Jacobson's theorem. And I mean, of course the point is, if you take this capital KW, right? So this is with a tilde over it, this is some sort of space. And you know it's homotopy groups, right? Because you know the homotopy groups of the KW spectrum. And then you have to think about what this stabilization operation means, but in some sense, it doesn't do a whole lot, right? Because you already have, I mean, it's sort of, it's already a group-like space with um, uh, like, it's, it's already a group-like E infinity monoid, so it pre-sheaf of E infinity monoid, so it already corresponds basically to a pre-sheaf of spectra. And so then what this operation here basically just does is it, it has to then do a motivic localization, right? And the fact, that um, this W guy was strictly homotopy invariant tells you that the motivic localization doesn't do anything. So that's why you can work it out. But so you had to put this in. So you know, of course, that sort of the capital KW is strictly homotopy invariant, right? So somehow if you stick infinitely many K, uh, infinitely many sort of sheaves of bit rings, you stick them all together, then you get this big spectrum, which happens to be homotopy invariant. But it's not obvious that if you take only half of these infinitely many she, uh, bit rings, that this thing is still homotopy invariant. This is exactly the sort of problem which is um, the failure of um, um, stable uh, connectivity boils down to. That you don't know that if you chop off some of the groups that the rest is still homotopy invariant. But okay, so in this case, we have the theorem of Jeremy and uh, then, then we get it. All right, and this now allows me to define the little kw. Right, so little kw this is going to be some spectrum, SHFS, ADA inverted, um, right? So it's going to correspond to E. In what sense? Well, this is, of course, so we've seen that this is an ADA local 
framed S1 spectrum. And we've seen that these two categories are the same, right? So, well, equivalent. And so now this makes sense. Um, so we can be more explicit. Uh, so little kw, it just means you take sigma infinity uh, framed of omega infinity framed of kw, and then you make it periodic. So if you think about um, how this equivalence works, this is, well, this is what happens. And you could also actually, instead of taking kw, you could take ko here, if you like that better. And then you make it periodic, right? So then, So it's clear a priori that these two things are, I mean, it's easy to see a priori that these two things are the same, but, um, and that this is uh, somehow, yeah. So the other thing maybe that I should say is that over fields, this functor, um, sigma infinity framed, omega infinity framed, it just uh, identifies with the um, very effective cover. So what this tells you is that this thing here is basically over a field, it would be little ko, and then you invert eta, so you get little kw, that's correct, the correct thing to do. And so then the, the instinct somehow is that over general basis, this would be some sort of version of the very effective cover, but which maybe has better properties. So I still don't know that the very effective cover, um, I mean, that this is the very effective cover in general, but in any case, this definition will have good properties because of this, right? So now we know that this is sort of a reasonable thing. Okay, so what have we established? We have proved that, uh, well, we know the homotopy groups, right? Pi star, little kw is just Wittring, well, chief of Wittrings at joint beta, and uh, it's stable under base change. Right, because we said that um, this thing here, this was, of course, just capital KO tilde, right? So this was stable under base change. I remarked this in the beginning. Um, and of course, um, we, we also have this adapts operation, right? So I have Psi three from uh, KW two goes to KW two. And if you want, I mean, this is sort of uh, omega infinity framed Psi three sigma infinity framed, and then you make it periodic, right? I mean, it's just, there's some functor which starts with capital KO and it produces little KW two um, and uh, you just apply this factor. So that's fine. Um, and then the point is that um, KW modulo beta is co-connected because, I mean, you just know it's homotopy groups. And so then the co-connectivity you check on homotopy groups or sheets. And then you can use the usual argument to obtain phi. All right. So what this tells me is that uh, we have in fact fulfilled like the entire uh, wish list. So we obtain little kw over any dedekind scheme Um, satisfying our uh, wishes, right? And then if you want, you can extend this to arbitrary base schemes just uh, well by base changing from Z. And then it will satisfy most of your wishes except for the things which was listed in bonus points. So you don't know the homotopy groups anymore. problem is that then you don't know the homotopy groups anymore, but um, okay. Of course, I mean, as I said before, I'm, I'm willing to believe that this Jeremy Jacobson result is true much more generally, maybe. And then you would learn that uh, the 
definition works, like the direct definition works much more generally. And then you would also learn that the homotopy sheaves take this form and then various things, which computational things, which one can deduce from this, you would also learn that they hold in general. Um, I would not be super surprised about that, but also it did not seem like completely trivial <laughs> to do this. Um, Sorry, can you, uh, can you show me again how you used uh, the Jacobson's result in, in showing that that collimate has the right homotopy groups? I guess that's what it boils, out, boils down to, right? Which so you have it? that. I mean, yeah, there's computa this computation of pi star of E. Right. I thought you're using that E is like Right, so uh, oh, co-limit yeah, so of something that comes from this, right? So yeah, I can yeah. then I, I will have E. This is going to be the motivic localization of well. So how am I going to notice? Yeah. So let me write something like sigma infinity um, s one and maybe I don't know pre um, of k w tilde, right? And I know I know all the homotopy sheaves of this. Um, right. So here pi star equals w adjoined beta right and now the mm. question is what yeah. is the motivic localization of this guy now i want to say it doesn't do anything but if that is the case then it must be that then i mu it must be the case that this width ring is already um hom strictly homotopy invariant right because the cofiber of beta just recovers this sheaf of width ring so i somehow need to know that um this w right so this does not do anything. Ah, you're saying that everything is determined by the homotopy sheaves. Yeah, if and only if that is all weak. Ah. Okay. okay, and now did Jeremy Jacobson tells me that this is true. Now, I mean, this is, seems very weird, right? Because if I take capital KW, which is just have like infinitely many Ws everywhere, then it's homotopy invariant. But how can that possibly be the case without W itself being homotopy invariant? I mean, it's totally possible, right? Because there can be some cancellation in the spectral <laughs> sequence, but I mean, yeah, but this is how I use it. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Right, um, so I wanted to say um, maybe two more things about this in, in this section. So one thing to observe is that um, this map, which you have, this turns out to be a zero connective cover. So you can do this by some different argument, basically, because, well, you know the homotopy groups everywhere and stuff like that, so it's not difficult. So this uh, is a, turns out to be a zero connective cover. Well, I mean, if, the, if, if, if S is a Dedekind scheme, right? Um, so therefore, KW is actually KW greater than or equal to zero. So that, that the, the guess which uh, one had at the beginning actually works. But the point is that if you construct it in this particular way, you actually know that it satisfies the properties that you want it to satisfy, whereas this definition somehow doesn't, doesn't make that clear. Uh, okay, so now let me just uh, say that in upshot, Right, so we build a map one ADA inverted localized at two maps to the fiber of um, KW2 maps via phi to sigma four KW2. Um, and we can do this functorially, sort of stably under base change on any Dedekind scheme. Right, so i.e. one eta inverse two goes to sort of JW um, and this is over any over any base. Now this will be an equivalence, of course, if and only if it is an equivalence over Z one half, right? Because that's somehow the the the, phi, the, ter the terminal object in this category. Equivalence for all S. If and only if an equivalence for um, Z one half, and um, 
this then tells me, uh, and then there's this, this fact, which I told you about before that over, let's say Z or Z one half, or more generally, I think um, finite dimensional, um, any finite dimensional base scheme, a map is an equivalence if and only if it is an equivalence on residue fields. So if and only if it is an equivalence over uh, Q and over um, FP, uh, where P is odd. All right. And so the, the, the point is then that I want to make is you can reduce to proving that this map is an equivalence, you will reduce to fields. And moreover, you can reduce to these very special fields. And uh, uh, the only thing which I'm going to use about these fields is that they have um, um, finite virtual cohomological dimension. Okay, and so now, um, yeah, so, the, so the, the, the last segment of my talk is basically that we can completely forget about everything about the last section, which I mean this section here. Um, and I'm just gonna try to explain how one proves that this map here, which over field, of course, we constructed in the beginning with like within five minutes, how do you prove that this is an equivalence over fields of finite VCD? Of course, once you know this, it will also be an equivalence of all fields, but um, whatever. And in fact, overall um, basis. But okay, so let's let's see if we can do that. And then I will I will I will give up. So now we do. All right, and then now, as I said, this is just a completely separate argument. Um, okay, so I come back to the to the story. So the goal, right, is to show that if I take one eta periodized localized at two, then this somehow had this natural map which we constructed to kW two, and uh, so this was just kW two greater than or equal to zero. And because you're over a field, it's completely well behaved, right? And then there was this particular map here, which we called phi, which we constructed, sigma for kW2. And what we want is that, and we know that this composite here is null. Um, in fact, in, in, in an essentially unique way. Um, and so there's going to be at most, right? So there's going to be an, a natural induced map from this guy to the fiber of this guy, uh, of this map. And we want to know that this map is an equivalence or equivalently, we want to know that this is a fiber sequence. And um, to be honest, there are many ways of proving this. Uh, you could try to use the slice filtration. I'm gonna try and use some homology argument um, they all boil down to some sort of accidental completeness results, which I'm going to state in a bit. But then basically, I think you just need enough, once you believe this, or once you have this, you just need enough dexterity somehow to see through whatever computational method you choose. Um, so I'm going to put um, HW, so this might going to be my homology spectrum, and it's just going to be, I take the eta periodic sphere, and I take the truncation into degree less than or equal to zero. Of course, right? So I know that sort of pi star HW star, right? This is just gonna be basically, you take the sheaf of vitrings and then you have sort of eta plus minus one. And of course, most of the time, just now to be sort of very clear what this is, but uh, most of the time I'm gonna suppress the second index because in our eta periodic um, setting, this is always boring, never does anything. So it's basically just the eilenberg maclean spectrum uh, corresponding to the sheep of bitrix. All right. Um, and now the thing to observe is that um, this is a connective spectrum and this is a connective spectrum and then the fiber is, uh, well, maybe minus one connective or whatever, but this is a map of connective spectra that we want to be an equivalence. And if you want a map of connective spectra to be an equivalence, it's enough to do this, I mean, in any category with a T-structure, um, maybe not the general T structure. Um, it's always enough to check this uh, after smashing with this kind of Einberg-McLean object. 
right? So by connectivity, suffices to show, well, I just take this sequence here and I smash it with the HW and I should still get a fiber sequence, right? So this is now HW2 goes to um, KW smash HW2 goes to um, sigma four of the same thing. And I want this to be a fiber sequence. Right. Now, why is, why is that supposed to be maybe more plausible? Well, how do you prove that this is a fiber sequence? So basically, you know the homotopy groups of this guy and you know the homotopy groups of this guy. So if it's a fiber sequence, then you need to know, the, then, I mean, you would know the homotopy groups of this guy and being a fiber sequence is basically the same thing as knowing the homotopy groups of this guy, which was of course the goal from the beginning. So this is maybe a bit too optimistic. Whereas here, um, this looks maybe a little bit more doable, right? Because it's a homology problem. Also, we know the homotopy groups of this guy, of course. And uh, well, we might hope that we can compute the homotopy group of this guy somehow. I mean, computing homology sounds like the first sort of problem that one has to tackle. And then, well, you have to figure out what this phi thing does, uh, but okay, maybe. And then you can try to work out what the homotopy groups of the fiber are and compare it with this. So two very similar problems, but hopefully, and of course, spoiler alert, um, it will be. Uh, more doable. Uh, okay. So we this is of course it's a, somehow it's a fiber sequence in in some big infinity category. So I want to reduce this to a more um, doable problem. And um, so the point is, it's enough to check this in some sense on homotopy sheaves, and then you know that for having a map between homotopy sheaves is going to be an isomorphism uh, if and only if it is on fields, right? And so let me just write uh, homotopy sheaves theory implies um, it suffices that if you look at the homotopy sheaves of the fiber of this map, right? And I evaluate this on K, then this should be the same thing as, um, well, so let me write W of K sort of in degree zero. So maybe just star zero and zero else. Um, and so where K is gonna be finitely generated over my base field K, right? And therefore it still has finite VCD. And I mean, of course, this is why I, I chose this condition finite VCD instead of choosing the condition being a prime field um, because in this way it's stable under these finite generated extensions. Okay, and so now since my the, the little or so the base field K was sort of arbitrary among fields having finite VCD, it just means that I can check it for little K. And then this is done, right? So if you take homotopy sheaves and you evaluate it on little k, this is also known as homotopy groups, right? Therefore, um, we want the same thing sort of on homotopy groups. Okay, so we're trying to do this. And uh, so, we're gonna, well, it's gonna be some sort of fight. And so one move is that you try to somehow, um, you can split up this kind of problem, right? So if you want a map of um, spectra, and if you want this to be an equivalence, it's enough if you want to check that it's an equivalence after inverting, let's say two, and after completing it two. And since we're already um, two local, if I invert two, this is just uh, tens basically just the tensoring with Q, right? And um, so if I tensor with Q, then it turns out that this is true. So true, oops, after tensoring with Q. Um, so why is that? So do I want to say that? Yeah, so maybe let's say something, right? So the point is that if I take KW and I smash this with HW 
and I tensor this with Q, then I bracket it like this. And then this is the same thing as just uh, the sphere eta inverted tensored with Q um, by a result of Ananyevsky, Levine, Kanin, right? And so then this tells me that this is just KW tensored with Q. In particular, I know what all the homotopy groups are, right? So this has homotopy groups, basically just W tensor Q uh, join beta. And then you can work out that the Adams operation, well, it's by multiplication by some number in every degree, except for degree zero, where you don't do anything. So if you take the fiber, well, there's, um, there's only sort of in degree zero where you didn't do anything, you're left with the W and then all the other, all the other maps between the rings, of course, were isomorphism because you're rational and you're multiplied by a non-zero number. So this is not particularly difficult. Or, uh, well, <laughs> you need to use this result, of course, <laughs> which is a bit difficult, but uh, once you have that, it's not particularly difficult to check that it's true after tensoring with Q. And therefore, um, it's enough to check this somehow um, after completing at two. So it suffices that so the pi star of the fiber of um, HW smash KW completed at two. And then we map this to sigma four of the same thing. All right, and I'm supposed to compute the homotopy groups of that and I'm supposed to get, well, I get, um, let's say W of K complete that two if uh, star is equal to zero and zero X. Okay, so basically, surely we can work out what it does in, uh, in degree zero. So basically, and I mean that the, that the map is an ISO. So the basic problem is to compute somehow the homotopy groups of this particular fiber, which more or less says we need to compute the homotopy groups of this and we need to compute the action of the Adams operation. Okay, so that's that's the goal. And I mean, that's what the real computation is. So I have some, so some recollection, right? So I'm using this this completion here. And so, so far I've not used it in any serious way. So I thought I would get away with just sort of saying the word completion, but so let me give you uh, some reminders on what this means, right? So recall um, if pi star E, if this has degree wise bounded two torsion, then somehow the um, completion operation is particularly well behaved, right? Then the pi star of the two-adic completion of this guy is just to take the pi star of E and then you two-adically complete this just in the usual sense of a abelian group. So the limit of the guy mod two to the F um, in abelian groups. And the other thing is that um, if we see the two of K is less than infinity then the Wittring has this property. Bounded two torsion. And moreover, if I take the Wittring and I complete it at two, it's the same thing as I take the Wittring and I complete it at the fundamental idea. So, um, I mean, neither of these statements are totally obvious but um, yeah, so, so one can do this somehow, some, some facts about the theory of quadratic forms. Um, in particular, right, so therefore uh, if I take HW and if I try to actually complete it, so I secretly only already used this here. Um, so pi star of this guy, right? So it's literally just gonna be W of K two adequately completed, which is the same thing as I adequately completed. Um, if star is equal to zero and zero Fs, right? So you could worry in general that this uh, is happening in some kind of area of spectra, right? So it's some sort of derived completion. So conceivably the, the completion here, it, should, it, it might not be the usual completion and there might be some pi one thing having to do with like infinitely divisible parts or something like that. But um, at least for the wittering over fields of finite VCD, this problem does not happen. All right, so now let me state a theorem. Theorem A, so it's a, our way of trying to compute um, doing this fight 
for the computation. So one can compute the homotopy groups of this completion. So KW smash HW to adequately complete it. One can just work out all the homotopy groups. So um, let's see if I can put it here. So it's going to be the vitring I adequately completed. And this happens if star is um, divisible by four and non negative. So you, you, it was easy to see that it had to be in non negative degrees. It's just a formula. It's not obvious that it has to be in degrees divisible by four, that it has to be this simple, but it turns out, which by the way, right? So this is the same thing as the homotopy groups of um, uh, the homotopy groups of this guy ha have the same description. But of course, it's, they're not the same spectrum. But anyway, so if the star is um, 4n greater than or equal to zero, and otherwise you get zero. So I'm going to say a little bit about how you do this computation um, towards the end. But um, for now, let's just run with it. What did I do here? Um, all right. So now we can reformulate our goal, right? Because the point was we had to compute, um, we had to compute well these groups. We've done that in some sense. So we need to compute this map. And then we need to check that we get the correct thing, right? So the goal, let me leave this here. The goal will hold sort of if and only if this map phi, well, what does it do? It goes from pi 4n plus 4, let's say, of this thing to adequately complete it. And then it maps to pi 4n of the same thing. Right now, of course, this thing here, we just said, this is isomorphic to the vitring uh, iotically completed. And uh, this thing is also isomorphic to the vitring iotically completed. And then there's going to be a map from here to here. But I mean, it's going to be a map of modules over the iotically completed vitring, right? So it's just going to be multiplication by some element. Uh, let's say n is greater than or equal to zero, right? So this map is just going to be multiplication by some magical element a n, um, right? So if and only if this is an iso, so this is some element which we have to figure out basically. Um, but so this will hold if and only if this a n guy is a unit. Ah, uh, a unit. Ah, but now, right, so we have the IID completion of this ring. Um, and so you can check this is a unit if and only if it will be a unit in the residue field. So this IID, uh, this IID completion turns out to be a complete local ring. Um, so this will be, I think, I just said complete local ring. And right now I'm not immediately clear that that's true. But in any case, you can check that this will happen if and only if somehow the image in W of K iotically completed modulo I, which in this case is also the same thing as um, W of K modulo I, which is F2, right, is a unit. But you see this quotient here, right? So this quotient was F2 and is basically completely independent of your field. <laughs> well, not basically, it is independent of your field. It's, it's just F2, right? Um, which means that I can check this after making my field as big as I want. So I mean, I can change base change, for example, to the algebraic closure. And I mean, note that then uh, the, the vitring of K bar is just F2 itself, right? Oops, what the hell is this? And I is just zero. So this situation is somehow a bit simpler because the whole completion, right? So the whole two idea completion just completely goes away. Yeah. Sorry, was that a question? Ah, okay, I don't think so. Okay, so I, I want these things to be units. I mean, in any case, the point is I can simplify, right? So I had this problem where I'm supposed to do something for any um, field of finite VCD, and now I just need to prove it for, let's say, algebraically closed fields. <sighs> OK. 
Okay, so now here's going to be another trick. So this uh, this took me somehow a long time to come up with. And there are, I mean, as I said, for all of these, there, there's going to be one thing which I'm going to mention a bit, which I think there's no way around. But apart from that, for all of this computation, there are many ways of doing it. Um, so here is here's a funny trick which um, one can use. Um, so let me recall that we know kw smash um, msl, right? We know the homotopy groups of this guy. Um, so why do we know this? Right, because we know by um, by work of Alexi that uh, whenever you have um, um, yeah, so I think that eventually we know this by work of uh, Ananyevsky. And uh, it turns out that this is the same thing. Well, I mean, by definition, of course, it's a KW homology of MSL. And this is what one can work out. And it turns out that it's just you take KW star, which of course was just the Wittring and joint beta. And then you have some polynomial generators. Let's call them X1, X2, and so on and so forth. And um, they have degrees divisible by four. Oops. Like this. And so here's the, the other theorem which I want to state, which is that um, suppose we are in this simplified situation. Ah, so now uh, you see the remaining problem is that we have to work out what this map phi somehow does, right? So if you take any spectrum, you look at its KW homology, it's going to have this very important operation coming from phi. And Basically, we want to understand what this does in some specific case, namely the, well, HW, so the homology spectrum. And so what I'm going to say is that if you take MSL, and if you're in the situation where the Wittring is very easy, then we can understand something about these operation in KW homology. So what I'm going to say is that um, then phi of Xi, um, so I want to, yeah, so uh, let me write this element x i minus one plus beta k w star msl so in other words you can work out this adams operation on this particular generator and basically you get the generator one lower except there could be some noise and the noise is somehow multiples of beta um and here, by definition, x0 equals 1. And uh, well, phi of x0 equals 0. This doesn't quite. Well, if x minus 1, you could define to be 0. But for example, phi of x1 is going to be 1 plus possibly some multiples of beta. Um, except, yeah. OK. So now I'm going to try to show you how uh, using theorem A and theorem B, you can uh, deduce the main result. And so we need to do a, a little computation. So let me observe, right? So we need to figure out basically how phi, I mean, what, what does phi do? Note that um, by construction, right? So what does phi do? It was basically you take psi three minus one and then you somehow factor it through beta. And somehow there was some specific way of doing this. But it tells you for sure that if you do phi, and then you multiply by beta, then you must get psi of x minus x, right? <laughs> this is basically true by definition. Um, in particular, it tells you that this element here is always divisible by beta. If your ring has beta torsion, then this division may not be unique, but certainly it will always be divisible. And if it doesn't have beta torsion, then you can reverse the process and you can figure out what this is, right? So therefore, phi of x is going to be psi of x minus x divided by beta if there is no beta torsion. I mean, of course, this holds, for example, uh, for example, in the homology of MSL, right? We just saw this is a polynomial ring on some guy without beta torsion, so it's without beta torsion. So this is correct. Um, and then we can compute, right? So psi of beta, I told you before, is going to be, right? So there's a sort of three here. So it's going to be nine beta. 
But now we're also in characteristic two, right? Because I had assumed that uh, the bit ring is F2. So nine is equal to one. So this is just a great idea. And so therefore what we learn is that um, phi of beta times x, well, I just put in this uh, formula here, right? So it's gonna be psi of beta x minus beta x divided by um, beta. And then psi is a ring homomorphism. So this is um, psi of beta, psi of x minus beta x divided by beta. But of course, we just said that psi of beta is just beta, right? So this is just equal to, I can just pull out the beta, right? So this is beta times um, psi of x minus x uh, divided by beta if you want, right? So I took this, this beta out and then now I reverse the formula. So I just get this is beta times phi of x, all right? So then the, the reason basically why I assumed that this, um, that the wittering is no, that the wittering is F2, that we are in this characteristic two situation because then somehow this operation becomes beta linear, which is uh, very helpful. And now, well, I mean, on KW star MSR, right? And so now I can use this formula here, which said that um, phi applied to XI, basically I get XI minus one plus some noise. And, um, so I can repeat, I can apply phi again, right? And then I get uh, phi of this one, which is xi minus two, plus some noise, plus phi of this noise. But the noise was multiples of beta and the thing was beta linear, so it's still multiples of beta. So then you get that um, phi, sort of if I do it i times, and I apply it to xi, basically I get one plus possibly some noise. Right, but um, so X must live in KW minus four MSL, which uh, you know is zero. So in other words, you find that if you do this operation I times you get one. And now this is a very curious thing, which um, well, I had not observed this before, but surely people who uh, work with these sorts of uh, operations know this that if you have some sort of ring and you have some sort of natural type operation, which, course, which connects some element to one, this tells you that if you work in some sort of setting where this operation always exists, as soon as you try to kill any one of these elements, you will kill one. So you will kill the entire ring, right? So somehow this, the, the fact that these XIs are connected to one, it makes them sort of, they, they're very strong. They don't want to go away. And this is what we're gonna um, exploit um, now. So we have this ring map, MSL goes to HW, basically it's just pi, but the map to pi zero the, Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. And so therefore we get KW star of MSL goes to KW star of HW and maybe let me call this map alpha. Um, and uh, it's going to send xi to something. And maybe let everything be implicitly to computed. And my claim is that phi applied to this uh, element, whatever it is, alpha times x, alpha of xi is non zero. Um, and uh, so that's clear, right? So the proof is that if I do phi i minus one of um, phi alpha xi, then that's gonna be the same thing as alpha of phi i of xi, but phi i of xi was one, right? So this is just one. And uh, this is not zero. <laughs> and so, well, okay. So then clearly this thing here couldn't be zero. Either. Very good. And so then what we learn is that if I look at this map, pi um, four n plus four of kw mesh hw completed goes by a phi to pi um, four uh, n of the same thing, right? So now this we know is just f two, 
and this we know is also just F2. And the point is that the map is not zero, right? Because here's some element, alpha of xi, it's going to live here, or alpha of xn plus 1, I suppose. And it's going to live here. And it's not going to be mapped to 0 by 5. So this tells me that this is not a zero map. OK. But uh, the only non-zero map between F2 is, of course, an uh, ISO, right? And I mean, in any case, uh, therefore, this sort of A and bar thing was non-zero, which is what we set out to prove. And so then what I've showed is that these two theorems together, A and B, they imply the, the main result, right? Okay, so then, well, I'm getting a bit tired now, but I want to say at least a few words about how to prove these theorems. So, right, so remember that the theorem B, the theorem B was that if you look in the um, KW homology of MSL, then you have these specific elements XI. And then if you apply this specific operation here, then somehow you get, you, you, right, so you can compute this Adams operation. And uh, now, of course, since we said there's no beta torsion, knowing what phi does is basically the same thing as knowing what psi does. And so basically what you need to know is something about the Adams action on the KW homology of MSL. Um, and the way you do this is, well, I don't have really have anything intelligent to say, you just mess around with the definition. So, so proving theorem B, basically you just mess around with um, the Adams action. So mess around with Adam's action. Uh, well, in terms of exterior powers, is somehow the easiest way to find. Right. I mean, you have to you have to work out, of course, how where is it here, right? So how these generators, what they have to do with the KW cohomology because in cohomology, things are somehow related to vector bundles more closely. And then you can try to do this geometric stuff. And uh, there's some dualization going on and a bit of that and a bit of that. And you don't know all, sort of all the things that you might want to know. But in the end, it's just doing some calculations and you, you come to this conclusion. So I, I don't have anything particularly intelligent to say about this. And so then, the last thing which I want to say is something about proving theorem A. And um, all right, so here, here is basically the main. So I think out of this entire computational section, the only or the main innovation is the following result, which is due to me and uh, in co collaboration with Elden Elmanto. And Paula and Ostva. And it's the following thing. If VCD2 of K is less than infinity, the characteristic of K is not two. And um, E is a very effective spectrum. Um, then the following happens. If you take the um, two adic completion of E, this happens to be ADA complete. All right, and so you will see in a second how I use this result. And um, basically there's like an obvious roadblock to all the known approaches to computing anything in ADA periodic homotopy theory. And um, so this sort of result will resolve this roadblock and basically all the approaches which I know. And then you can you can somehow push your comp through your computation one way or another. Um, oh, and maybe I, yeah, so I'm not going to say how to prove this, but basically it comes from an analysis of the slice tower in terms of the um, homotopy co-niveau tower of Mark Levine. And uh, well, it uses block Kato and it uses various things. So um, this is, Quite difficult, I would say. 
but it's basically an adaptation of some argument of Mark Levine. Okay, so now let's give you a sketch how to, to prove theorem A, right? So remember what was theorem A? I mean, it's basically the computation of the homotopy groups. Where is it? Here, right? So basically we just try to compute these homotopy groups. How hard can it be? Okay, so what do we do? Well, I put sort of KW and then this is gonna be pi zero of you take the sphere and you model, right? Nothing ADA periodic now, it's just uh, modulo H where H was um, one plus minus one, right? A hyperbolic plane. Okay, so this is some homotopy module known as with K theory. Um, and I mean, you can work out what it is, right? So there's a sort of, there's a bit ring in degree zero, there's the bit ring in degree minus one and it keeps going like this. And here you get the sheaf of fundamental ideas in degree one and um, the sheaf of squares of fundamental ideas in degree two and so on and so forth. So this is some homotopy module, which I'm gonna use. And the one has um, some homotopy module. And what you have is uh, that this guy is basically very effective. So it's not obvious. Some older result of mine is at least if you suspend it sufficiently far, it becomes very effective. So of course I'm gonna feed this into here at some point. And uh, so now I'm gonna bring, bring to bear some more tools. So we have the Milner conjecture which I mean, of course, is a difficult theorem, but uh, it's true in any case. And uh, it basically says that if you take this with guy and you mod out by eta, notice that multiplication by eta is basically just then sort of natural inclusion. Here, it's gonna be an ISO and here is sort of the inclusion of I squared into I and I into W and so on and so forth. So what you get here is uh, mod two Milner K theory. On the other hand, um, we have the bloch kato conjecture. Again, a theorem. And uh, what this is going to do is I look at the motivic cohomology spectrum, or two. And uh, then basically, you know, the bloch kato conjecture says that the homotopy groups of this guy is mod to Milner K theory adjoin a polynomial generator tau. And so if I mod out by this guy, what I'm left with is uh, mod to Milner K theory. All right, and so the conclusion is that if you take um, so little k o smash with um, k w and you mod out by eta, um, and so then. The point is that if I take little kw mod out by eta, I get this thing, which is the same thing as this thing, right? So this is equivalent to little k o smash edge z mod two, and then you mod out by tau. And this is known. Right, so this uh, is gonna be some specific sum end of h z mod two smash h z mod two, which can be characterized uh, explicitly. Um, so it's, it's known, it's known, or oh, whatever this word is, is known by work of um, Ananievsky and some collaborators whom uh, I don't remember who, probably Oliver Röndings and some others. Anyway, so we know what this guy is. And then the idea is you, you run a Boxstein spectral sequence. And uh, the goal is to determine basically um, to determine, pi, right, so you determine this pi star star of sort of little k o smash capital K w, and then you ADA complete it. Okay, so in general, the Boxstein spectral sequence is some device which tries to figure out the completion at some element, for example, ADA, from um, the reduction modulo that element, for example, ADA. And then of course the, the, the first information is uh, somehow some D1 differential, which is some Boxstein, which is why it's called a Boxstein spectral sequence. 
And in general, there are many more like differentials and it's not at all clear that this works, but the point is that somehow this, this, this turns out to be very sparse and you can just completely determine the entire, the entire thing. Um, so I'm not gonna give you the answer because it's a bit messy, but when, when one works this out. And then you invert eta sort of in this answer. And what you get is that um, the homotopy groups of what did we do? We take KO and we smash it with KW and then we completed it at eta, right? And this is basically where we know the homotopy groups and then you know what it means to invert eta. So let's invert eta like this. And then you find that um, you get the vitring to identically completed um, if star equals four n greater than equal to zero and zero n, right? So this is basically the answer which you wanted, um, but it's the answer which you wanted, but it's not the question which you wanted. That's that's somehow the problem, right? But this is sort of, in. I mean, the fact that I put KW here with the upper case sort of upstairs W and not something else, that's maybe some idiosyncratic thing, but the, the obvious sort of strategy for computing anything eta periodic is you somehow you compute some eta completion and uh, then you invert eta. And the problem is that it's not at all clear that this is what you wanted. But so the point, uh, so what, what, what's the point? Yeah? So the point is that uh, if I take little ko and I invert eta, I get little kw. I take capital kw and I invert eta and I get um, hw. And now here comes the trick. So I do KO smashed with KW, ADA completed, um, ADA inverted. And now let me complete it at two, right? Because in the end, I was supposed to work out something to complete it. So let me just complete it at two for the hell of it. Now the, I can certainly move the two completion where I can yeah, so this, so for example, ADA periodization, it preserves two complete equivalence. It does not preserve two complete spectra, but it will preserve two complete equivalence. So I can add another two complete in, completion in the inside. Okay. And now here's the, the very interesting fact is that if I complete it at two, then um, it's already ADA complete, right? So, is that right? So, um, I think that's what I said. You mean you just want to use that, yeah, amount of star and yes. Yeah, exactly. So I want to use this result. And so then I think what this means is that I can, well, okay, so let me just do this. So I do, I'm slightly confused, but let's see. The point is I can drop this ADA. Ah, presumably is what I want. Ah, okay, <laughs> so that's a bit stupid now, right? So now the fact is that I have this two added completion on the inside and on the outside, so I can drop it again. So this is just KO smash KW, ADA inverted, two identically completed, and then I use what I uh, had here, right? To get um, KW smash HW, two identically completed, and this is what we wanted, right? And so the point was, that I can compute something ADA complete and uh, I deduce something which does not a priori have an ADA completion inside. And this is why you need this, um, this, this completeness result here. And uh, yeah, I would say this is the main sort of computational innovation which makes this work. But in any case, then we conclude, we conclude that this thing which we computed, which was the right answer, but the wrong question is actually also the right question. And um, okay, so I think I'm going to stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. 
Yeah, so mission. I wanted to, to ask um, Tom, uh, so is he aware that there is more than one type of uh, homotopy structure in the relative uh, uh, setting and the more than one type of pullback? Uh, can this help somehow? Is this respond to the beginning, more or less, of your talk? I'm uh, yes, so I'm sort of aware. Uh, but first of all, thanks for the question, and um, I think this, yeah. So I think there is something to be explored there. That's right. So instead of doing the usual pullback, you can do shriek pullbacks, and in some ways, they are sometimes better behaved. Um, then of course you need to figure out what it is somehow if you want to do computations. But uh, well, I'm willing to believe in absolute purity for various things. So. Um, yeah, so I think possibly one can use this and I've certainly tried to do it, but I could not uh, uh, succeed. But yeah, I mean, I think that's a natural thing to try and I, I was too weak maybe. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? So the only time you're using uh, the characteristic assumption is for proving that, for using that result with uh, El Manto and Dostoyer. Right. I'm, I'm not quite sure that's true. So I mean, there's this um, Jacobson thing, and it definitely uses characteristic not two because, well, I mean, for various reasons. And then we use it here. Um, this sort of thing. Right. So the fact that this is known is also very much a characteristic not two thing because otherwise, right? So you use, you inject this into HC mod two smash HC mod two, um, and then in order, right? So I, so the characteristic not two thing is very much built in, in a lot of places. And as I said, you could, for example, use the slice spectral sequence, but then it's the same thing. I mean, you need to know sort of the slices of the sphere mod two, and again, you've no chance in character. Well, I think that these things should probably work in characteristic uh, two as well. Or I mean, maybe slightly modified in some interesting way, but I don't see this should totally break down, but certainly the proofs use it all over the place. 